This week we'll be looking at the development of industrialization in the United States and housework. So last time we were looking at women in the American Revolution and I ended with the concept of Republican motherhood, which is also um, defined as Christian motherhood. And in this picture, you see that idea, right? It's more of an ideal, I guess, than, than a reality where, you know, the mother stays home. She has her 2.3 kids. The father goes out to work. And, um, you know, we, we kind of see in this, in this particular picture how dirty the house is and it has to do with industrialization, right? All the, you know, all the, all the pollution that is created by, you know, factories comes into the home and, those of us in Arizona can probably relate to it since, you know, we have our windows closed for six months out of the year and yet we get dust in the house, right? So uh, we're looking at this constant, we're, we're going to do a few things in this particular lecture. Look at the value of housework, which you'll have an activity to address that. And also note that housework becomes industrialized. Housework becomes a job um, where uh, women are working many hours, uh, even though they're not getting paid a, a particular salary to do the jobs that they're doing in the household. And this goes uh, in connection with the concept of citizenship, right? Where in American culture, we only kind of value um, people who make money, you know, go out into a job force, collect a paycheck. And there's a sense of independence associated with that. Yet, uh, what we see in, in the 1800s, or you know, even throughout history, but we, what we see in this particular period is that women are also working, even though they're not working at some factory, though some are, um, the, these women that are staying at home and taking care of the household, they're working, they're working very hard, yet they get no credit for any of that in regards to uh, enfranchisement. So uh, it's important to note that um, housework, uh, becomes important elements of this new industrial economy, yet women are still seen as dependent. So we're going to look at as to how that happened, uh, particularly in the Jacksonian period, which is about 1830 to, uh, I guess, you know, somewhere around the 1830s. And uh, we're going to go up to like the uh, 1840s. <clears throat> so we'll skip that question. Uh, so first, before we get started, we're going to look at how, in very kind of general terms, um, how we define the concept of citizenship in the United States. <clears throat> um, during the colonial period, you have this concept called, you know, as we're developing into a nation, you have this concept called Jeffersonian democracy. And this is based off uh, Thomas Jefferson and his ideal of what a good democracy is. And what he argued basically was that the farmer, uh, you know, a person who lives out in the country, uh, grows his own food, sustains himself, and then whatever excess he might have, he might sell at some market. Uh, so the farmer represents this ideal citizen, according to Jefferson, uh, because in his belief that uh, is that he's completely independent and not corrupted by particularly the city life. And um, again, it's very problematic because as you all know, Jefferson had slaves, so it's not like he was out there toiling the, the field uh, but in, in his mind, in, in, in the early Republic, we see these, this idea kind of take hold. Therefore, if, if you're independent, um, you should have a voice, right? So that, that's part of the reason why, uh, people like, um, uh, the landed, they're not aristocracy, but, you know, landed people in the United States are the first people to get the vote rather than, you know, poor white men even, right? That doesn't happen until the Jacksonian era. So Jefferson believed, you know, people who live in the city are, are, are just disgusting. You know, they, they corrupt society and, you know, those are the bad Americans. Uh, by the 1830s, though, our economy begins to shift. You know, maybe in the 1700, late 1700s, you have some farmers and, you know, maybe they're growing their food and being uh, self-dependent. But the reality is by the 1830s, the United States is going through an industrial shift where factories are beginning to pop up and people are going to to these places to you know work and also to to get a salary so this is what shapes this concept called jacksonian democracy now jackson he provided suffrage 
to the working class. Um, a lot of people, a lot of times, people say because he wanted the vote, <laughs> he wanted their votes, and he was kind of pandering to the working class. Nevertheless, um, white working class male get the vote. So even though we believe that white men got the vote early on from the developments of this country, that's not the case. It, you know, it took a couple of decades for for white poor men to get the vote too. <clears throat> Uh, but he, uh, Jackson, just Jacksonian democracy really kind of uh, exemplified this idea of the free market. Um, whereas Jefferson was more about you know, farmers, uh, Jackson was more about the city and industrialization. So why is this important to us? Well, um, in the farm, what you have is that women and men are kind of working together. Not that things are equal, but nevertheless, women are important to the farming um, industry. With the growth of cities and uh, an industrial economy, you begin to see that separation of spheres. It's not complete. Um, again, we're talking in very general terms, but you do begin to see this idea that I presented at the beginning, where women go to the work, uh, sorry, men, uh, men go to the workforce and women stay at home. And this is something that we begin to see this kind of definition of value. Uh, Hamilton, or I think there's a play called Hamilton, right? Well, it's the same Hamilton here. He kind of looks at, at, at this uh, ideology of only things that make money have any worth, right? So therefore, uh, if you're making something that makes money for the economy, then you have some kind of self-worth. Uh, and if you don't, then you don't, right? You're, you're dependent on somebody else. So there you begin to see uh, the separation of, of gender, where women are in the home, right? They're not making any direct money, right? Uh, cleaning the house, washing dishes, you know, uh, washing clothes or anything like that. So we begin to see the separation of spheres. And... It's funny because there's this guy named Tocqueville. Uh, he's a very famous person who basically kind of traveled throughout the United States and, and was a, a French guy who critiqued, you know, uh, society, particularly here in the States. And, and he kind of noted that it, it, in the United States, there's a very clear distinction between the sexes. You know, uh, again, this notion that men belong in the public sphere and women belong in the private sphere. And he says this, in no country has such constant care been taken as in America to trace two clearly distinct lines of action for the two sexes, arguing that, again, a separation of, of gender spheres. And, and unlike the, the yeoman farmer, we begin to see people being a little bit more urban. Um, I think at this time, most people still live out in the country. Um, it's not until about the 1900s where you have a clear separation, like a 50-50 divide where you know, half the population lives in the urban centers and half live out in the country. Um, but um, you do have a growing middle class in cities where people are entering the cities um, not to farm, right? Because you're not going to farm in New York or, or big cities, right? Um, Philadelphia. But rather, they're there to seek wealth, right? So maybe you start off with a job, but the ultimate goal is to be your you know, self-employed, right? And in doing so, and again, this is very ideological, right? In doing so, if you are successful and you, and you do create wealth and profit, uh, it creates this notion that you're doing good for the community, right? Um, it's very paternalistic, in other words, right? Men are doing these good things for society by giving them jobs, even though these jobs are crappy and paying them barely a minimum wage. Or livable, livable wage, I say, not minimum wage. Um, it's it's uh, in their mind they're doing something good, and God has bestowed upon them, you know, um, this kind of favoritism, if you will. So the ultimate goal for most people, uh, maybe even today, but back then, was to reach the status of an entrepreneur, right, uh, of an employer rather than an employee. So where does this leave women? Well, it leaves them in the position of of the home, <clears throat> this notion of Christian motherhood, of Republican motherhood that I talked about earlier in, in the previous lecture. Now, it's directly linked to Protestantism uh, because it emerges from there. And it's the notion that women 
in, uh, belong in the home because it's their nature, right? Uh, for them, it's so effortless to do many of these tasks that are associated with the home. And, and just to give you an idea, these, these um, ideologies are still in place, uh, maybe not as strong as they used to be, but definitely still there. So in the 1950s, every commercial right, had women when they're selling you know, dish soap or, or any home appliances or things like that. Uh, but even not too long ago, uh, a couple of years back, I remember watching a commercial where I think it was a Bounty, the napkin commercial. And um, the, the boy and the, uh, and the father, they, they spilled some, some drink on the floor and they're just looking at the, you know, this spilled drink like a bunch of idiots. And uh, like, what do we do? I don't know what to do. You know? <laughs> and then the mom grabs the, uh, the Bounty napkin and just kind of effortlessly walks by and, and kind of sweeps her um, hand with a napkin uh, in her hand and, and wipes clean this mess that they created. So um, again, this isn't this commercial wasn't done in the 1830s. It was done, you know, maybe six years ago, I think. So these ideas are still there that women are just naturally prone to do housework, right? And, and this goes back generations. Uh, and in particular, in the context of this new industrial era, where um, it's nothing like the industrial era of maybe today or, or even uh, 70 years ago, you know, they created. Um, for their partners, for their husbands, a safe place, right? The men have to go out and work and you know, try to make a living. And women's responsibility was to create a safe space, if you will, for their husbands. All right. Um, I'm going to stop it right there, have you do an assignment, and then we'll come back.